Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Advanced Optimization of Your Echo Images and Doppler Evaluations. My name is Kelly Baer and I am the Creative Design Manager with Marketing Communications at IAC. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to review a few technical matters with you and let you know how you can participate in today's session. We would like today's webinar to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit questions. To do so, make sure the left side panel is clicked open. At the bottom of the left panel, click on the Q&A icon and the questions panel will appear. Please submit your questions anytime during the webinar as we will be monitoring questions throughout the presentation and we'll try to answer as many of them as possible during the Q&A period. Also at the bottom of the left side panel is the resources icon. Click on this icon for links to today's handout, which include a PDF copy of these PowerPoint slides. Select the file name to initiate download of the handle, handout. Lastly, in the lower left, please note the home icon. If you experience any technical problems during the course of this webinar, you may click on this icon. A tab labeled technical support will list a brief FAQ along with the phone number for webinar support. For those who like to take notes during the presentation, look to the right of the slides and click the tab labeled open. There you will see a white text box where you can take notes on today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the session. To be eligible for the SDMS CME credit, you must be registered, logged into this webinar, then complete the survey from the IAC Pro Library site. If you are viewing this webinar in a group, please be sure you are also registered and logged into this webinar on your own computer so that we have record of your attendance today. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted at a later time for on-demand viewing. This webinar is a joint presentation of IAC and the Society of Diagnostic Medical Sonography, SDMS. And now I would like to introduce Beverly Gorman, IAC Director of Accreditation for Echocardiography, who will tell us about today's guest speaker. Bev? Thank you, Kelly. It's my pleasure to introduce Pam Burgess to you today. Pam serves on the IAC Echocardiography Board of Directors, and she represents the SDMS. She is manager of the Cardiac Ultrasound and Stress Testing Lab at Wake Forest University Baptist Medical Center in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Pam brings more than 25 years of experience as a sonographer, so a true expert. In addition to the board of directors, Pam is also an IAC application reviewer. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Pam. Okay, thanks, Beth. Um, and, and all I can say is, wow, we have over 1,100 participants on today, and I, I think that is fabulous that we have this many sonographers that are hungry for education, CMEs, whatever your reason you're on here for. So um, I, I'm just um, overwhelmed by that number of, of participants today. So we'll start by, um, if you read the IAC mission statement, you'll see that we are dedicated to ensuring the quality of patient care. Today, there's an increased awareness on quality in the ECHO lab. The IAC works with more than 12,000 sites across the U.S. and Canada to provide a pathway for documenting quality patient care. Uh, quality in the ECHO lab goes hand in hand with image optimization which is our topic for today's webinar. Image optimization was an obvious choice for this webinar to ensure that we're improving the quality of our ECHO procedures. Much of what we will be covered in this presentation today, um, the sonographers will already know and recognize. But as we tend to um, be pushed to produce more and more every day, we let some of these things slip by. So. Uh, this is it's going to serve as a reminder um, for most things that you'll see here. So over the next hour, we will cover um, such things as basic optimization, and we'll also cover um, numerous things on advanced optimization today, including the evaluation of prosthetic valve, contrast, and, and many more things there. So let's stop, start by optimizing the 2D image here. We know harmonics has been around in the echo lab for some time now, and we utilize it on a daily basis. 
but I wanted you to just notice the image on the left as compared to the harmonics image on the right and the difference that we see there in the image quality, the resolution, how harmonics brings out um, better endocardial definition on our echocardiograms. So this is one thing that we do on a daily basis to um, help optimize our 2D image. Another tool that we have in the Echo Lab this um, day and time is image colorization. And this is something we utilize a lot in our Echo Lab. Um, as you can see here, this patient has um, rather severe LV dysfunction. Um, and the image colorization helps to um, better see the endocardial definition here. Um, and you can see the smoke in the left ventricle here. So this um, would clue the sonographer that they need to interrogate the ventricle much better and looking for a thrombus or, or whatever here. Um, image, image colorization also helps um, when the sonographer is tracing the uh, 2D image here of the left ventricle for ejection fractions and volumes. So um, it's really an important tool um, when assessing the left ventricle. So when all else fails, we have contrast. And we do utilize contrast a lot in our echo lab. Um, in 2010, contrast was put into the standards with IAC. And you have the standard listed before you here. Um, the third one, I think, is the most important thing. And that kind of clues you in as to when you should be utilizing contrast. And we think contrast should be used in the presence of poor endocardial border definition or um, for the quantification of chamber dimensions, volumes, ejection fraction, and also for the assessment of regional wall motion abnormalities. So um, contrast is probably the one tool that I would recommend if, if you can't see good endocardial definition, this is the one thing that will improve your image quality in your lab and, and help with optimization with your um, echo. So how do we use contrast? Um, endocardial border definition is, is what we hear most often. And for those of you that are currently using um, contrast in your lab, you probably began using contrast with stress echo. And, you know, if you think about stress echo, we're always looking at that endocardial definition there, trying to uh, see the walls of the heart throughout the stress imaging. We also utilize contrast um, with ejection fractions. And in our lab, when we utilize contrast, we use um, it to trace out the ejection fraction. So it is an important tool when um, that's in, important for our um, ordering physicians. We also use um, contrast for the enhancement of intracardiac structures, things um, that we want to bring out, like a, maybe a thrombus in the apex or a tumor that could be within the left ventricle. We also use contrast for RV enhancement for such things as RV volumes and RV function. Say you have a patient that has an inferior wall motion abnormality, and uh, we know that we can also have RV involvement with that. So you would want to make sure that you're um, visualizing the right ventricle well. So contrast can help there. We've even used contrast for the enhancement on an aorta. Even with a transesophageal echo, you know how sometimes you'll get the linear artifacts there? Today, um, many of the TEE probes have harmonics on them, so we can utilize contrast with those and um, be able to tell if the patient has a dissection or not. We also can use contrast for Doppler enhancement, um, such as for aortic stenosis or tricuspid regurgitation. Um, aortic stenosis um, is uh, one that we can use LVO contrast for because it's over on the left side of the heart. Um, the LVO contrast does a little bit better than saline contrast because the um, bubbles are smaller, they're more uniform in size, so we get a, a better delineation of the Doppler signal as with um, saline contrast, say with our tricuspid regurgitations. Okay, so here's an image, um, a quad screen format. So it's a, um, a stress echo. This was actually a dibutamine echo we did here in our lab. And the sonographer was um, having some trouble visualizing uh, the endocardium and all the different views. So elected to give the patient contrast. And you can see here that it um, enhances the walls very nicely. 
Um, I like to say that stress echo probably is the one thing that stresses the sonographers the most. It's, it's some of our most difficult imaging, especially with exercise echoes, where we have to get those images very quickly when the patient comes off the treadmill. Uh, we usually tell our sonographers, if you can't obtain all five images within a minute, then you probably need to look at using contrast because that's what you're going to have to do on impost. Um, also on impost, there's several other factors that have changed with the patient, much like their um, heart rate, which is um, now very rapid. Uh, their breathing is a lot more rapid, deep breathing, things like that that can cause you not to be able to see all of the walls on impost, which is the most important um, period that we're going to be viewing these um, different views. So contrast with stress echo um, just kind of goes hand in hand with quality. It's something that needs to be there. So um, and on this particular patient, you can see that um, in the bottom right, that, that is our recovery phase. And you can see how this patient um, very much dilated out and the uh, wall motion abnormalities are a lot more prevalent there. So um, I also recommend doing recovery phase on a stress echo. Okay, so chemo patients are patients that we're seeing more and more in the echo lab today. If you'll focus on the image on the left, you'll see where the sonographer traced out the ejection fraction from an apical four chamber view. And uh, you know, I think overall did a fairly good job. Um, it was very difficult to see, but we tell our sonographers if you're guessing more than you're tracing actual endocardium, you probably need to go to contrast. So on this transthoracic echo, the sonographer did elect to utilize contrast, and you can see that image on the right, which I think um, the ejection fraction probably is, uh, I would say, a little bit better than what was traced on the uh, image on the left. Um, and you can see walls there that um, you probably would trace a lot different than um, they did originally with the view on the left. So uh, chemo patients are kind of um, uh, our priority patients with contrast. We like to um, make sure that we're doing everything we can to adequately assess the ejection fraction. Because if, if they see more than a 5% drop in that EF, um, they can pull their, their chemo, and, and we want these patients to get their chemo and, and get cured of their cancer, so we don't want to create something that may not be there. So contrast offers us a more consistent way of tracing that left ventricle and, and producing a good, accurate ejection fraction. Okay, our next um, case here is one where we utilize contrast for a thrombus that's in the apex of the left ventricle. You can see uh, the image on the left there. You can see um, a fairly decent apical four-chamber view, and we see a, a thrombus um, in the apex of the left ventricle. But the reason we gave the contrast was because of this area right here in the, um, the lateral wall of the left ventricle where we don't see it as clearly. And you can see after we've gave contrast, you can better define the um, wall motion in that area, plus um, it very nicely brings out the thrombus in the apex there. Okay, so we're going to be looking at kind of a potpourri of things today. And so we're going to talk about um, our left atrial volume measurement next. Uh, we see a lot more labs doing left atrial volumes, adding that to their protocols today, and, and that's great. Um, what I would encourage you to do prior to starting is to make sure that you're optimizing your apical four and your apical two chamber views, because these are the two views where we're going to be tracing our atrium, making sure not to foreshorten the apex, because that can af affect your left atrial volume measurement. So we're going to measure at the end of systole or just prior to the mitral valve opening. And we will begin our trace on the atrial endocardium um, on, the mitral, on one of the mitral valve annulus. And then we'll end at the opposite mitral valve annulus, being careful not to trace into the pulmonary veins or the left atrial appendage. So we do that on both the apical and four chamber views. And you can see here the sonographer has very nicely traced from 
the septal mitral valve annulus around to the lateral annulus here in the four chamber view, being very careful not to trace into the um, pulmonary veins or um, if the left atrial appendage was shown there, not to trace there. And we also do not trace up to the mitral valve leaflet tip. See how we uh, very nicely bring that across from annulus to annulus? That's very important to do in both the apical four and apical two chamber views. So. Okay, so let's talk about right ventricle measurements. Uh, we don't routinely do this in our lab, but from time to time we do need to make a right ventricle measurement. So we do this from the apical four chamber view, and we make our measurement um, right on the QRS, and we measure um, um, right from the right ventricular side of the interventricular septum over to the endocardium on the RV free wall at about the level of the papillary muscles in the left ventricle there. So a relatively easy measurement that can add a lot of information to your echo. Another measurement we need to do from time to time is our right ventricular free wall measurement. And you can see this is done from a subcostal view. We have um, stopped this um, screen here on the QRS. And so what we do is just go up and measure from the uh, internal edge of the endocardium there over to um, the edge of the um, pericardium there to get just a quick right ventricular free wall measurement. And from time to time we do see where we think a patient might have right ventricular hypertrophy. So this is just a good, quick, easy way of showing your physician this um, measurement. Okay, so next we're going to talk about optimizing your Doppler signal. We're going to talk about color Doppler, spectral Doppler, continuous wave, pulse wave, and even most everybody's favorite, PDOF. So um, PDOF is, is very important. Remember, it's um, one of the st cases that you have to send in for your um, accreditation is on aortic stenosis where um, PDOF is required. So we want to make sure that we talk about that um, pretty thoroughly today. Okay, so first of all, we're going to talk about color Doppler and adjusting the gains here. Um, so prior to applying the color Doppler, um, make sure that you've adjusted your 2D gain, you've cleaned up your image, um, utilizing your overall gain or through your TGCs just to uh, clean the 2D gain up. And you can see the image there on the left. It's kind of difficult to see good uh, color definition because the, the 2D gain is set so high. The image on the right, we've adjusted the 2D gain here to kind of clean up the ventricle, the left ventricular outflow tract, so the color is, is much easier to see there and to see smaller jets. Um, we also need to adjust our color gain, and I would encourage you to do this throughout your study, not just once and, and think it's okay for the rest of your um, echocardiogram. Just do it throughout, especially when you move from higher flow states to lower flow states. Okay, adjusting the color box size is also important. You want to make sure that you keep the box relatively small, do a focus study over the valve that you're interrogating there. Okay, color optimization with PISA is extremely important. This is um, a, a measurement that makes a huge difference in our PISA calculation. So we want to make sure that we've done this part extremely accurately. So you would want to adjust your um, color gain, and then to do your PISA measurement, you'd want to zoom up on this area, adjust the baseline down between 20 and 40 in the direction of the regurgitant flow, like this is mitral regurgitation, so you would um, push the baseline down, and you just adjust it back and forth between the 20 to 40 range until you've optimized the radius here. When making your measurement, make sure not to go below the valve level, and you can use your color subtract to um, tell exactly where you are, and then you want to measure out just to that outer um, yellow rim there in the color. Okay, other things you can do to improve your Doppler exam is to adjust your 2D image to become parallel to flow. And by that, what I'm talking about is to center your image over the valve. Um, 
it's, it's okay to foreshorten if we're doing a Doppler exam. Okay, you don't want to foreshorten your image if you're looking at the 2D image, but if you're just doing color Doppler, sometimes this will bring you closer to that regurgitant jet. And I'll show an, show an example later in this presentation. You also want to utilize your color Doppler for your sample volume placement, and we'll talk about that also too. Um, you want to use saline contrast or even LVO contrast to improve your Doppler signals, as we've already talked about. Okay, so now we're going to talk more about optimizing the signal with spectral Doppler, continuous wave, and pulse wave Doppler, and even the um, PDOF probe here. One of the things I, I continuously see is the Doppler scale to be set very high and the, the Doppler um, very scrunched up. This makes it, it difficult to measure, and actually your measurements are not as accurate as if you would spread them out like the image on the right. So that's just a quick um, decreasing the Doppler scale there, and that can very much help to improve the accuracy of your measurements. Also, increasing the sweet speed can help as well. The image on the left, the sweet speed set at 50, the image on the right at 100, and you can see how much that spreads the signal out there and would make it easier to do a trace or a point measurement. We're going to talk about everybody's favorite topic here, which is PDOF, um, and like I said earlier, a very important one for um, your Doppler exam and for your studies that you send in for ICAL accreditation, such as your aortic stenosis um, studies. Here, of course, we're required to, to do PDOF, and we're looking for a good signal from a non-apical window, okay? Apical, everybody usually does and does fairly well. It's when we get to the suprasternal notch and the right sternal borders where we see it kind of, um, get a little hairy for some of the sonographers. So um, first of all, I would like to encourage you to label your Doppler so we know where it's coming from, suprasternal notch versus right sternal. It, it's sometimes difficult for us to tell where those are coming from. But if you can't get it, it's a good study, it's one you want to send in for ICAL accreditation, just get someone else to help you with it. You know, call a second sonographer in, get somebody else to, um, help do the Doppler on this particular patient. Okay, other things that we want to look at here is our Doppler tracing. You can see the image on the left is an actual trace that was done in lab. And I'm not sure what the sonographer was looking at when they were tracing, but obviously not the true signal. The one on the right is much better. I put this in just so you're aware these can make, um, these, like the trace on the left, can make a huge difference with your mean uh, gradient. So be very careful in tracing these. Just to summarize your spectral Doppler, expand the scale. So decrease the scale to incorporate it throughout your um, spectral Doppler. Increase the sweep speed when needed to trace out measurements, just so your measurements are more accurate. Utilize your color Doppler to help place the spectral Doppler cursor and check your gain settings throughout your Doppler study. Okay, our mitral valve inflow um, is another thing I wanted to touch on today. Mitral flow velocities are, are fairly simple to get, but our, our biggest thing here, what I want to uh, dwell on a little bit today, is placement of the sample volume. Everyone usually does pretty good setting their sample volume size fairly small, but sometimes we have to look at our color Doppler to tell if we're parallel to the flow, the mitral valve inflow. We know that um, the mitral valve inflow tilts just a little bit toward the lateral wall, about a 20 degree turn toward the lateral wall of the left ventricle. As the left ventricular um, chamber dilates, it becomes more directed laterally. So as that happens with your patients, you know, utilize your color Doppler to tell exactly where that Doppler flow is going and make sure you place your sample volume at the leaflet tips of the mitral valve during diastole or when the mitral valves open. If you're trying to optimize the duration of your A velocity, you can move the sample volume back slightly toward the mitral valve annulus to do that. Okay, here's um, sample volume placement at the mitral valve leaflet tips. 
you can see that um, we set these pretty much right where the uh, mitral valve leaflet tips are when the valves open, and it gives us very nice peaks on our E and our A waves here, and that's what we're trying to achieve. So if, if you're not getting those nice peaks there, you might want to try moving your sample volume around just to ensure you're parallel with that flow there and in the, um, at the proper spot at the um, leaflet tips there. Okay, tissue Doppler imaging is um, something else we'll go over today. What we're looking at there is um, the myocardial velocity. So we're measuring the actual velocity there. So we know that these are much slower than the blood flow Doppler. Uh, the amplitudes are greater than the blood flow Doppler. So for this reason, we need to develop a tissue Doppler preset. So it's, it's not always good just to switch over from blood flow Doppler over to a tissue Doppler. Um, tissue Doppler also requires um, high frame rates and lower gain settings for tissue Doppler. Remember that what we're recording is the longitudinal motion of the mitral valve annulus. We're actually measuring the velocity of this. So we would want to utilize our apical windows so that we're parallel to the motion of this annulus there. So typically what we do is the um, septal, the lateral, sometimes we'll even go over and do the RV free wall annulus as well. Here's an example. Um, what, what we always tell our sonographers to do is ensure that they're um, parallel to this motion, which usually moves back and forth like that, and that will ensure that we're obtaining the highest velocities of these waveforms um, that we're measuring. So when you would want to move over to get your septal annulus, you would maybe want to slide your transducer over so this was more in the center of your screen to ensure that you're parallel with that motion there. Sample volume placement is also very important when we're uh, looking at our apical five chamber view and we're um, placing the sample volume in the left ventricular outflow tract, especially on patients with aortic stenosis. And this is something as reviewers we evaluate on your studies. Well, are you parallel with the flow? Uh, do you have your sample volume placed at the right point in the left ventricular outflow tract? Being careful not to get down too, cl too close to the valve and get into the flow acceleration. So you can see here that the sonographer has very nicely um, placed this sample volume at about the right spot there in the left ventricular outflow tract, and they're parallel with the flow here. So they get a nice envelope on their left ventricular outflow pulse wave Doppler. This also is a, a very important component of the continuity equation and can affect your valve area. Okay, tricuspid regurgitation is another thing um, that we see sonographers um, doing much like this on a daily basis. They'll place their, their um, transducer at one spot, they'll do their mitral valve Doppler, then they'll angle up, do their five chamber Doppler there, and then they'll just kind of swing the um, cursor over here to the right side of the heart looking for any um, tricuspid regurgitation with spectral Doppler. And you can see here this waveform is not adequate. I'm not sure even what they're really measuring here because it's so difficult to see. But if you slide the transducer over the right um, ventricle there, you can see that we're looking pretty much right down the barrel of the tricuspid valve, and we've lined it up very nicely with the regurgitation there and become parallel with that flow. So what that gives us is a much better Doppler signal, and it allows us to measure this um, tricuspid regurgitation jet much easier than previously, and will also give us more accurate velocities across this. Pulmonary venous flow is um, uh, sometimes easy to get and sometimes very hard to get. You know, usually when it's very hard is when we need it the most. So um, what I would um, ask you to do is utilize your color Doppler to um, in a four chamber view and just place that over uh, the area where you think your pulmonary veins are to help localize them. Um, that will help in the guide, the guide and placement of your sample volume. So we like to start with a sample volume size of about two to five millimeters and place the sample volume into the pulmonary vein about one to two centimeters 
within it. And we just use our color Doppler to help confirm that we're parallel with the flow there. Here's an example where the sonographers very nicely placed the colored um, Doppler box down over the um, entrance there of the pulmonary vein into the left atrium. You can see it very nicely coming in there. And places over here, they placed the sample volume about one to two centimeters down within the pulmonary vein there. And um, the spectral Doppler um, produces a very nice signal here. And we know this can be very important sometimes when we're looking to tell if our mitral regurgitation is severe and, and seeing reversal here in the pulmonary vein. So, Okay, inferior vena cava is another thing that we look at throughout our study. I came from an abdominal ultrasound background here, so was very used to scanning below the diaph diaphragm and, uh, you know, was always felt that was my image that I could routinely get very nicely on the echo when I first started doing echoes. But um, mainly what we're doing here when we're looking at the vena cava is just looking at it throughout the cardiac cycles here. We'll have the patient kind of breathe in, breathe out to see um, how the um, uh, vena cava uh, dilates and um, get smaller with respiration and all. And we also um, do measurements here, which we'll go over in just a minute. And we can also see um, this hepatic vein very nicely as well there. So we like to um, spread the vena cava out in like a longitudinal approach here, okay? And this is on an ideal patient. Most of the time, this is what we get right here is the image on the left. You can see that we have a lot of um, gas overlying the IVC here, which makes it very difficult because this is a, a really important part of our exam if, if we're trying to assess the pulmonary pressures here. So what do you do? Well, uh, we as sonographers have learned that, you know, if we have the patient taking a deep breath, sometimes this will displace the gas. Uh, we also can push around in there, and sometimes we can push it out of the way, do other maneuvers like that. But one I've found um, from my abdominal experience is if we go around on the patient's ribs, around on their right side, we can angle the transducer through the patient's ribs, and looking through the liver here, we can see the vena cava there. I, you know, I know it's not ideal. It's, it's not a great image. It usually puts it a little further back in the far field for us to look at and, and can sometimes be difficult to see. But at least we can see, you know, is the vena cava collapsing? We can sometimes get a measurement. It may not be in the ideal position for the measurement, but we can at least put a cursor across it and give our physicians an idea if it's enlarged or if it's normal in size and if it's collapsing with respiration there. So, so when we see people measure IVCs, we see it done in a variety of ways. So I thought we could um, go over that today. Here um, we have a still frame of the IVC. And notice the sonographer has very nicely laid it out um, longitudinally, okay? So what we would do is measure at end expiration, and we'll measure just proximal to the junction of the hepatic vein. So right here's our hepatic vein. So we can very easily put a cursor there and there and measure the um, IVC very nicely on this patient. Okay, moving on, uh, one other thing I thought would be worthwhile to cover today is hepatic vein Doppler. We um, utilize the same view that we were just looking at there from a subcostal approach. Uh, we just angle the transducer to become parallel to the flow in the hepatic vein. We use a two to five millimeter um, size sample volume and we place it one to two centimeters proximal to the junction of the hepatic vein and the inferior vena cava. Also, I would encourage you to utilize color Doppler to confirm that you're parallel to the flow there. Okay, so here we've utilized our color Doppler over this and we very nicely see that hepatic vein um, flow coming right back toward the transducers there. So we've placed our sample volume in there and here's our display of our hepatic vein there. So, um, and I realize this one's um, 
probably one of the easier ones to do. The vena cava and hepatic vein are a little dilated, but typically those are the ones you need to look at too. So, um, you know, just be sure that you're tucking it back up into the hepatic vein about one to two centimeters. Okay, we talked a little bit about foreshortening, and I thought this slide was worthwhile putting in there because it shows good foreshortening and bad foreshortening, okay? So first of all, let's focus on the image on the left. And of course, you can see this is quad screen format. It was an exercise echo, okay? This being our resting image, this our in post, and this our recovery. And you can see a, a pretty significant difference in the left ventricular chamber here from rest to our in post image. With the resting image um, looking like the apex is a little thicker wall than the one on the right here, so I would say the image on the top left is a little foreshortened as compared to our in post image. So this is a case where foreshortening is not good, okay? And this is actually one of the things we review you for on your ICAL images that you send in for accreditation. You know, was the apical views foreshortened? So this is something you want to be very careful with. You want to drop down to a rib space and just make sure that you're as low as you can go and view that apex as well as you can. On the other terms, there are times when it's okay to foreshorten. And uh, the image on the right is a apical four-chamber view where we're trying to get a good view of the tricuspid regurgitation and even a good um, TR jet on spectral Doppler. So by foreshortening here, we're able to get a little closer to this and we're able to line it up to where we're more parallel with this flow here with the tricuspid regurgitation. So in this case, it's okay to foreshorten because we're not really looking at the 2D image here or the RV apex or anything. We're just concerned with the, the color flow and the spectral display on this tricuspid regurgitation. So, and, and by doing this, again, it allowed us to become parallel with this flow. Okay, so let's talk about suprasternal notch imaging. This is something that when I'm reviewing, I commonly see being omitted on the aortic stenosis cases. So when we're doing suprasternal notch imaging, of course, we're imaging the aortic arch, and it is a required view for IAC in the presence of certain situations. And those, um, some of those could be aortic stenosis, bicuspid aortic valves, looking for coarctation, uh, suspected um, aortic dissection, things like that. So mainly when we're looking at your aortic stenosis cases that you send in, we look for this view. Um, some tips to improve your quality on your suprasternal notch imaging. Mainly, I think, is positioning of the patient and, and just taking the time to do that properly. Um, I like to put a pillow underneath their shoulders, and I tell them that it's not going to be comfortable. I'm going to be hyperextending their neck, and I ask them to turn their neck to one side, or turn their head to one side, I'm sorry, just so I can get my transducer in there. Um, I use a high-frequency transducer, and I make sure that I'm positioning my focal zone up in the near field. And here is a, um, a nice suprasternal notch image. You can see the um, ascending aorta, transverse aorta, and the descending aorta, and then some of the vessels coming off the arch there. Other things we might want to do is spectral Doppler. You know, I would encourage you to locate your landmarks like the vessels that are coming off. Utilize pulse Doppler and pulse through the descending aorta when you're um, ruling out a coarctation. Um, place the um, pulse Doppler sample volume also in the correct location over in the descending aorta when checking for flow reversal and the descending aorta for aortic regurgitation. Okay, saline contrast, we've talked a little bit about. Of course, this evaluates for atrial shunts. We can also evaluate for persistent left superior vena cava. Um, that's when it drains into the coronary sinus. So we, we would want to make sure that our IV is in the patient's left arm. Uh, we locate the uh, enlarged coronary sinus and watch for it to be uh, pacified with the saline. 
Uh, we can also utilize saline contrast to enhance right-sided Doppler flow, such as with tricuspid regurgitation. And here is a saline contrast study that we've done. You can see um, that we have nice opacification in the right side. Um, we wait to see if any bubbles cross. If they don't, we have the patient do a, a valsalva, um, kind of bear down and on release, see if there's any bubbles that come across into the um, left atrium or left ventricle. And as you can see, we have some that very nicely come across here. So. We use, um, also use bacteriostatic saline. We uh, utilize two 10 cc syringes and about nine um, cc's of bacteriostatic saline and about a cc of air. And we just swish those back and forth between the two uh, 10 cc syringes uh, via a three-way stopcock just to get the uh, saline very frothy looking. Um, and then we bolus them in and watch them come in the right side of the heart and then have the patient valve salva to see if we can increase the pressure and, and push any of uh, the bubbles across there. We also can utilize saline to enhance the TR signal. Like I said before, sometimes um, with regular saline contrast, these get a little hard to measure. Actually, the LVO contrast works much better because of the uniformity of the size of the bubbles. So. Okay, going to prosthetic valves now. Um, this is something that I felt pretty strongly about adding in because I think prosthetic valves, imaging, Doppler and all that is, is difficult. It's a difficult subject to talk about, so we might as well go ahead and um, hit that while we're here. I think where you need to start with these patients is to get a lot of clinical information you know, get the date, the type of the valve they have, the size of the valve, and most of these patients have a card in their wallet and they can show it to you. You can write that down, put it in their patient history, and therefore you have it as you follow them annually. Um, also ask them about any symptoms, any related clinical findings that they may have. Um, obtain a blood pressure. We always type in our height and weight on these patients and, and get a BMI. Um, and also review their previous echo or their post-operative studies. And I think that's, that's probably the most important thing you can do prior to starting this patient. Imaging of prosthetic valves is sometimes extremely difficult. Um, we like to make sure that we evaluate the motion of the leaflet or the occluder. Um, you know, do everything you can to optimize your image. Uh, zoom, make sure your focal zones are in the correct position, narrow your sectors, things like that. But what we're looking for mainly is are these leaflets in here moving, okay? Uh, you can see how this um, mitral valve replacement is put in, okay? A lot different hemodynamics going to be going across this valve now as it's angled this way when we assess it with Doppler as when it was uh, with the native valve when they were going more in this direction. So we may have to go to an off-axis view to, to adequately look at the um, Doppler across this um, particular valve here. So we want to make sure that we evaluate the structure of the, the valve, the sewing ring, things like that uh, with our 2D image. And also with Doppler, we want to make sure that we're looking and obtaining peak velocities and mean gradients across these valves. Like I said, they don't, the surgeons don't always put those valves in like they took them out. So they may have really funny angles on them. I've done patients where we've had to get the, the spectral Doppler from a peristernal long axis versus an apical view because of the way the, the valve itself was put in there. So also we want to be very careful um, looking and evaluating the valve for the presence of regurgitation. We all want, also want to note and document the location of the regurgitation and also the severity of it. You know, look in, in case, this case here of a, a prosthetic mitral valve, you know, assessing the pulmonary veins to see if there's um, a reversal of flow there, things like that, that would help the, our physicians um, speak to the severity of the regurgitation there. So um, I think that brings us to the end of this presentation here, to the question part, which I will turn back over to Kelly at this point. 
Okay. Thank you, Pam. At this time, we'll begin the Q&A session. And I'd like to introduce Frank Vermeeren and Sandy DePetris, our Senior Clinical Specialists for IAC Echocardiography. We have Frank, Sandy, and Bev assisting Pam with the Q&A session today. Frank, would you like to start us off? Absolutely. Uh, Pam, uh, the first question comes from Allison, and she asked, is there ever a time to not use harmonics? Um, sometimes our physicians ask us not to use harmonics if uh, we see, say, a mitral valve and it looks thickened. They like to look at it with and without harmonics to decide, uh, you know, just about the structure of the valve. Is the, is the valve thickened or not? So there, I think there are times where we do this. So, yes. Hi, Pam. This is Sandy. A question came in. Are there contraindications for use of contrast with stress echo? Hmm. Um, in our lab, we still check the patient's um, O2 saturation. Uh, we ask them about any lung problems. We, um, gosh, what else? We look at their pulmonary pressures. Our cutoff is at 60. Uh, for their um, estimated pulmonary pressure. Um, and at that point, what we do is we get, gather all that information, we take it into our reading room, discuss it with our physicians, and we look, do the risk outweigh, you know, the need for this patient to have contrast? And we, you know, look at each one of these on an individual basis. We had actually a couple questions around about colorization of the image or B-mode color. Uh, they basically, they're saying, does colorization actually help? And uh, in many cases, some labs feel that colorization, if you, if you have to colorize an image, you might as well use contrast. Um, how do you feel about that? Um, well, I would, you know, I think it's an individual basis type uh, answer here. I would want to look at it, but I think there are times when colorization of the image has helped me trace around um, and, and just, uh, you know, kind of retain that confidence that I am seeing endocardial definition here and, and just not doing the dot-to-dot -dot trace there, which may or may not be endocardial definition. But um, so I, I think sometimes it does help. I think sometimes it will help um, enhance, say, uh, maybe a thrombus in the apex. Um, but, I, you know, on the other hand, I can see their comment. Majority of the time, you pro on these very difficult patients, you are going straight to contrast. Nicole asks, if you get a valve closure click on the LVOT Doppler sample envelope, does that mean you're too close to the valve? I would say at that point you're probably down in the valve, and we like to um, bring ours out into the outflow track right about the level where we make the left ventricular outflow track 2D measurement. We had three questions regarding RV measurements. Uh, one was about the RV free wall. How thick does it have to be to be considered RVH, and is it an appropriate measurement for pediatrics? And the next one is, um, how big should an RV be to be considered enlarged? Well, I wouldn't want to quote numbers over here, but there is a very nice poster that ASE has put out on the right heart, and I would encourage you to go to acecho.org and look at their posters, and they um, very nicely lay these measurements out and all the normal values. As far as pediatrics, um, I'm not a pediatric sonographer, so I would not want to answer that question. And Courtney asked, <clears throat> when you're looking at the sample volume for the aortic valve LVOT, do you find it more important to be parallel to flow specifically or to show a hollowed out spectrum for the envelope? Hmm. Well, I would, you know, I would encourage her to um, just ensure that she's in a good apical view where you can line the flow up parallel to the Doppler, parallel to the color Doppler, and just work with your sample volume, pulling it in and out, 
to obtain a, a nice envelope there where you feel like you're not in the um, flow acceleration, but you are, you know, getting a good adequate signal. Uh, we, uh, Deborah had a question about any specific tips for optimizing the supersternal notch images. I, you know, I think the one thing that helps me more than anything is, like I went over in the presentation, is to um, position the patient adequately. I know some of the elderly patients that we're looking at with aortic stenosis have the arthritic necks and, and do not like their necks hyperextended. But, um, you know, I, I think that helps a lot just getting their chin out of the way and being able to get the transducer in there. But, um, I, you know, I tell them to look toward me, and, I, and I'm one of these weird people that scan, you know, from I started from an abdominal background. So I had them uh, turn their head to the left and look at me and with their neck as hyperextended as I can get it and just, you know, work with the transducer to um, uh, try and image the arch as best as I can. And, and that's a rotation and an angle at the same time. I usually start with the notch um, kind of back toward their right shoulder. And, you know, sometimes the elderly population, you know, will their arches look different to me sometimes. They're, you know, sometimes they're very nicely arched and then sometimes they're in these um, uh, different kind of configurations. So they can be very difficult at times. Um, you know, I, I think some of the things you do is you, you know, bring up, go up to a higher frequency um, transducer, um, decrease your depth some, bring your focal zones up. If you're having trouble telling if you're in the correct location, sometimes I'll turn my color Doppler on just to kind of help direct me what is actually vessel here and what are other structures. So all that I think can help. I've even, you know, tried to go over um, supraclavicular and, and look at it, you know, no, but most of the time without much luck, but I, I do feel like I'm giving it my all and, and doing everything I can to, um, to, to obtain that view adequately in patients. So sometimes I even roll them back up on their left side and just move up their rib cage, you know, like from a peristernal approach. And sometimes on those patients that have nice wide rib spaces, you can actually see a, an arch from the um, left peristernal approach. So um, those are all ideas. And I know the reason I put that in there is because it's, it's a very difficult view to get in the adult population, but it's one that, you know, is required under certain um, pathologies and, of course, is required by ICAL with your aortic stenosis patient. So um, I, I felt it was worth putting in there. Um, I knew I probably would get some questions. What do you do when they're so difficult you just can't get them? Well, you just put it in there, you label it, so we know you've attempted it. Right. <clears throat> I have a couple of questions, Pam, about um, saline and bubbles. One, uh, Kenneth asks, why the left arm for saline bubbles? Is the right arm okay if that's the only access you have? And then also about the same thing, should you draw up a little blood into the agitated saline solution in order to get a better froth of bubbles? Okay. Uh, the reason I brought up the left arm was with the um, persistent um, uh, venous that you know we're, we're looking for, and that has to be done in the left arm. But as far as for just a regular saline contrast study, we um, will start them in either arm, the easiest vein we can find. We'll even go through an existing IV um, and, you know, if, to go in closest to the needle hub as we can uh, just to ensure that it's not diluted. Um, as far as pulling blood back, I have heard of people doing that, and I've heard that it, it gives a very nice um, saline contrast study but that's not something we routinely do here. But, I, you know, I don't, I don't think it's bad to do it. Um, I've heard of many labs doing that. So it's just not something we practice here. We had a few questions regarding the IVC, uh, IVC imaging. And uh, from Richard, he said, do you routinely perform short-axis views 
of the IVC to confirm collapse if not due to translation? We do not in our lab, but I don't think it's a bad idea. I think it, um, you know, it, sometimes you can just slide off the side of the IVC and it looks like it's collapsing when maybe it's not. So, I, I, you know, I think um, he's probably going that extra step for his patient and, and thoroughly interrogating the IVC to ensure that it's collapsing. So I think that's a great idea. It, it's just not something we routinely do, but um, I, I can see why he would do that. I also have two questions about the IVC. One was, do you find it helpful to lower the color scale when evaluating the pulmonary vein color flow? And what is a, an approximate normal size for an IVC? Okay, um, as far as lowering the scale, that is something that we do from time to time. Uh, if we see when we're down in the vena cava, um, most often we'll have fairly good flow with our, our settings that we utilized up in the heart. We move to the um, hepatic vein, things like that. The, slow, the flow seems to get a little slower. So at times we will lower the scale, uh, increase the gain a little bit to try and um, bring that flow out. And what was your other question? There was a second part to that. About the approximate size of a normal IVC. Oh. We use um, less than two in our lab, but of course we also look at our BMI on the patient too. So you can have a very um, small woman who, um, a, you know, a two centimeter vena cava may be large for. So that's one of the reasons we include BMI on every patient now. I have one last question. Gary asked, how problematic is it regarding hemodynamics when you have the patient hold their breath in order to get a good waveform? Does it change your, I guess, calculations or whatever? I'm not sure. I mean, I would think it's probably according to what you're looking at, but for the most part, you know, sometimes when we're doing our Doppler exams, we'll see the waveforms fluctuate. You know, they'll go, kind of go um, a little higher, a little lower, you know, and I think some of that is due to respiration. So it's it's not a bad idea to um, have them suspend their respiration um, and, and look at it that way. So I could um, see what he's talking about there, and um, I'm not sure how problematic it would be, um, but, you know, if, if it's a patient where it varies greatly, you may just want them to have – to suspend their respiration and make your measurement off of one of those waveforms. And I have a question that, uh, in general, whenever you're making measurements in the cases of AFib, but the question is how reliable is tissue Doppler information when performed on a patient with AFib? Should it be, still be performed? Well, I think it varies greatly. Um, we will go ahead and perform it and uh, do the measurement on it, and we let our physicians decide. But it does vary greatly when a patient is in AFib. So they probably pretty much throw that measurement out and, and don't report it. A lot of questions came in after Pam finished speaking, so um, we can handle them after the fact if you need us to. Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah, maybe why don't you go ahead and ask Pam one more question, and then I have just a, a, a small announcement, and then then we'll wrap it up. Um, <clears throat> do you have one particular, Frank? Well, I think there's a general question here, and it goes back to use a, use of the PDOF or the non-imaging transducer, and the questions really are surrounding: Is it really necessary to use a PDOF? Uh, especially for the experienced sonographer, do they really need to use it? Uh, I would say yes, because I can tell you um, aortic stenosis is something that's very near and dear to my heart. I love working with the PEDOF probe. I, as a sonographer many years ago, um, prided myself in utilizing the, the PEDOF probe and pushing myself to use it on normal patients to become proficient at it. And I think over the many years that I've been doing echocardiograms, I can tell you the majority of the time I feel like I get the higher gradient from a right sternal border. 
And um, if you can obtain a right sternal border gradient with an imaging probe, then, you know, I, I've never been able to do that. You know, I've had them where I've tried and tried and tried to get them with PDOF probe, gone back in and tried to image with the um, imaging probe and, and do it that way and have not been successful. But I think for the, the big reason that um, a lot of times the higher gradient does come from a right sternal approach, that I think um, the PDOF probe should be utilized in aortic stenosis. And Bev, I, I would yeah, like to hear I'll, your thoughts on that one. Yeah, <laughs> I'll I'll just stick my two cents in there. Um, you know, it's it has nothing to do whether you're an experienced sonographer or not. It, it the most uh, it has to do with is the actual physics and the transducer. And Frank can back me up on this. Um, the dedicated Im non-imaging probe does nothing but send a Doppler sing signal in and back out and receive it. Your imaging probe is doing a whole lot of other things. Um, so, you know, number one, your chances of getting the highest velocity are going to come with that non-imaging PDOF probe. Um, the other thing that Pam mentioned is you can get into spaces that you cannot get into with an imaging probe. I don't care, you know, how good of a sonographer you are. You're just not going to get into some of those spaces. Um, and I, I just lost my train of thought, but th there are many, many, many reasons. And trust me, this has been discussed and debated by the board of directors over the years. Pam, how many times? Several <laughs> and, times. <laughs> yeah, and the end result is, yes, it's a necessity. Yes, it's an excellent tool in your ECHO toolbox. So, you know, pull it out. Don't be shy about using it. And if you need practice, like Pam said, use it on your, on your normals. That's what I did until I got really proficient with it. So, yeah, you have to use it. Um, and so that I think uh, I'm in just a second, I'm going to turn it over to Kelly um, so she can talk about the CME and everything. But I just wanted to give you all uh, just kind of a heads up. In the next couple months, a uh, few months actually, we're going to have two more um, live webinars presented. The next one is going to be on January 22nd, 2014 at 1 o'clock. It's going to be presented by uh, Laura Johnson, who is a sonographer from Aurora Health in Wisconsin. And the topic is Contrast Enhanced Imaging, How to Get Started, A Tale from a Facility Like Yours. And it's really uh, an excellent presentation. And the next one is going to be in February, on February 26th at 1 o'clock. And it's um, a step-by-step -step approach to the TEE electrical leakage uh, test. Um, so, again, just, you know, maybe mark your calendar, try to save the date. I think um, they'll, they'll be definitely worthwhile. And they're also, you get a CME. So, with that, Kelly? Okay. Thanks, Bev. Uh, please feel free to contact the IAC ECHO team with any questions that were not answered during the Q&A session. I think they will try to get to all of them. Um, to receive the SDMS continuing education credit for attending this webinar, please complete the survey, which will appear on your screen concluding this session, and is also available at the IACprolibraries.com website for an additional three business days. In the upper left, you'll click on My Webinars. Look for the title of this session, Advanced Optimization of Your Echo Images and Doppler Evaluations. Beneath this title, you will see the link, Take Evaluation. Click this link to complete the survey. Your certificate will then be processed and then emailed to you directly through SDMS about a week following the webinar. If you have any questions about the survey, please contact us at webinars at intersocietal.org. Once again, we thank you all for joining us today and appreciate your participation. <laughs>